a very special segment here at Aging 2.0. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we really believe in the power of intergenerational innovation and believe strongly that the people who understand the needs the most are the older adults themselves, the people who work with them every day, and those busy family caregivers. And I think the insights that we can glean from people who are living and breathing a lot of these experiences every day is really important. And so we had the pleasure of getting to know um, Barbara, Barbara Knickerbocker Beskind, um, through our relationship with IDEO. Um, on your right is Gretchen Addy, who is an associate partner and portfolio lead with IDEO here in the Bay Area. She leads up IDEO's initiatives around aging. She's going to tell you a little bit about that domain of work and how they're thinking about it. As many of you probably know, IDEO is one of the leading design and innovation consultancies in the world. Um, they take a very human-centered approach that I think has tremendous implications for our industry. And I want to read you um, Barbara's um, description because I just think it's so amazing. Um, so Barbara Beskin is 91 years old. She joined IDEO in 2013 to focus on problems specific to aging adults such as healthcare delivery, retirement home services, contact lenses, and dynamic design of glasses frames. She's an occupational therapist, a conceptual designer, an inventor with multiple patents, a retired army major, and the founder of the first independent private practice in occupational therapy, which is called the Princeton Center for Learning Disorders. In her 44-year career, she's been internationally recognized for both her writing, she's an author, as well as her patents, and was honored by the American Occupational Therapy Association as a charter fellow. She graduated from the Home Economics School of Syracuse University in 1945, and we are honored to have her here to talk with us about the importance of designing with, not designing for. And so I'll hand it over to Gretchen, who's going to give us a little bit about IDEO and how they think about this space, and then we'll have a little conversation with Barbara um, to, with some insights. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And in fairness to Barbara, full reveal, because you didn't put my age on there. Um, <laughs> I am 64, so we are two different generations. Um, so designing aging, that's why we're all here. All of us are in the business in some way, shape, or form to design for aging. And as was pointed out, this is about designing across the generations not just about those last 30 years of anyone's life. I believe, and I think IDEO believes very strongly, that we are all designers. We all have a part to play in this. And if you think about it in the context of design thinking, which is, along with innovation, a big buzzword these days, um, design thinking really does start with people and what is really desirable. And there is a lot of value in the viability and the feasibility. But if you don't get the desirability right from the beginning, I venture to say that it's probably not going to be successful. So really thinking about people, and that's what we're here to talk about today. And think of this as, as a bit of a dialogue, a little fireside chat between the two of us. So as Katie pointed out, we're designing for people, and we're not designing for an age group. Too often, um, I have clients come to IDEO who say, you know, I've got all this data, and I've all got all this market research. And a lot of it really focuses on an age group and a category, as opposed to on real people. People are the ultimate agents of change. And you really need to be designing for their motivations and behaviors to unlock new outcomes. And this is about bringing new things to the market. This is not about incremental improvement, because many of you here are entrepreneurs, and you are bringing new to the world things. And so it is really important to think about this through people. And you need to design with them not for them. Many of us have the best of intentions, and I've been guilty of it myself, because for many years I took care of my parents as they were aging um, in my own home with my family. And 
I come from a background in architecture, and I was taught how to design universally. I was taught how to meet all the regulations for handicap accessibility, because my father was in a wheelchair. But when it really came down to designing something well for him, it was my interaction with him directly as an individual in need um, and him guiding me as to what were the best solutions. So people and their experiences are really the cornerstone of what we need to begin with. So I would like to introduce Barbara. Um, Barbara introduced herself to IDEO. Uh, it's been maybe two years ago now. Uh, she wrote a letter to IDEO after seeing um, something on television about the design work that we do. And that introduction opened up a relationship that continues to grow. And I'm going to let Barbara tell you a little bit more from her own perspective about why IDEO. But for the past two years, we have been designing with Barbara. And she has been an inspiration and a change agent in many ways for our organization with all of the work that we're doing in the aging space. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Barbara. And I have a few questions for her as well. And we'll try and leave some time at the end for you to ask questions, too. So with that, Barbara. Thank you for inviting me. I am thrilled to be here. I am a user. I'm a designer. I am an untrained designer. I train from my years of experience in particular as an occupational therapist. I was working with physically handicapped army, um, usually uh, combat injured soldiers from World War II, Korea, Vietnam. I also worked in the polio epidemics. I was trained at Georgia Warm Springs Foundation where Roosevelt was treated. I was trained under his therapist. And I was trained in particular in making braces, hand braces, to support the very weak muscles of the hands. And also, these braces were used to attach devices for holding a fork to, to eat with, a spoon, a writing device. From that experience, it was, I was the first occupational, th the only occupational therapist in the Army to ever be sent to Georgia Warm Springs for my six-month graduate program, uh, training program in brace making and treatment of polio patients so that I could come back to Walter Reed Army Hospital that at that time was receiving all of the patients east of the Mississippi, whereas Letterman Army Hospital, as you know, here in San Francisco, received all those west of the Mississippi. We had ward after ward of patients and dependents, children, wives, and many others, the soldiers. What else? So why IDEO? Why did you write that letter to IDEO? <laughs> well, I was bored. <laughs> One simple word, bored. I had moved here from New Hampshire. I knew no one out here except my family who had moved me here. And now they've moved to LA and Pasadena, so I'm here on my own. Uh, I was living in a retirement community. Um, lovely people, about 150. We have independent apartments. And 22 of them also have assisted living. You can have assistance one hour, 24 hours a day. We have some wonderful caregivers. We have others who have never really been trained well and are doing what they think is right. And they're very caring people, but not always trained well. Uh, on the other hand, we have some who are very well trained and who are very caring. I moved there partly because of my age. I was then 88 and uh, had begun to, to lose my vision seriously. I could no longer drive. I had a driver uh, for my car. My family moved me out here. I had no, no family out in the East Coast in New Hampshire. 
one family in Arizona, one family here. I moved here, and I was really interested in finding something where I could interact with young people as I have all my life to engage with people who had a passion. And here was IDEO who had a, a staff of people who had a passion for design, for creative thinking, for problem solving, and what could be a better fit. I applied. Gretchen called me within a few days said, come for an interview. She and another partner interviewed me and showed me around the Palo Alto office for about three or four hours. She said, you'll hear from us. And a few days later, she said, when can you, can you come on Monday? I expected to meet with a team of people around a conference table. And she said, you'll, they'll want to know what your background is. Well, I sat down at a table for four and then I thought, well, I thought there were going to be a few more people here. I thought it was going to be about six or eight that I'd be talking with. Turns out the man across the table stood up and he said, well, as you know, Barbara Beskin is here on campus today. She'll be talking to us for 20 minutes, and then you can ask her questions. <laughs> really? <laughs> I got up, and although I couldn't see the people, I could tell by their actions they were very involved and interested in, in, in engaging me. It was a wonderful experience. Yes, it, it corresponded very serendipitously with an effort that we were doing at the time um, called Designs On, which we do every year, which is um, actually challenging our designers <laughs> to do something that is um, purely conceptual sort of blue sky, and each year we choose a new topic. And as it happened, Barbara arrived at the same time we were launching Designs on Aging. And so we invited Barbara as sort of her first task at IDEO to sit and talk with the designers who were interested in um, thinking conceptually about that space and kind of outside of the box. And um, from that moment on, she, she continued over the course of the year to be an inspiration to them as well as um, to many of our clients, uh, particularly clients that we work with um, not only around aging, but actually around eye care. Because of her macular degeneration, she has um, a very unique perspective there that she can offer and really challenge as an extreme um, some of the um, needs in that space. So talk a little bit, Barbara, maybe about your own prototypes and the work that you bring to IDEO that is yours. And because it is a two-way street, Barbara is developing and designing things still, and particularly for friends of hers. And so it gives her an opportunity to access our shop and some of our engineers and designers to support her efforts. So maybe talk a little bit about that. Well. To start with, I'd like to say I saw somebody here who may be in my vintage who was a very smart lady because she's using sticks. That's June. <laughs> I use my sticks. These are really uh, ski poles that I've adapted because not only does it maintain my balance, which you lose your, some of your balance skills as a, uh, as a um, becoming uh, legally blind. Uh, but it maintains your arm like normal gait pattern. And that's very important uh, for many reasons, balance especially. I've adapted this, my sticks. I call them my go-go sticks. I have a trekker. I call a trekker, my go-go trekker, which is the a substitute for the, nor for the current walkers where people have to lean on them, the, the handles are horizontal, and people lean on them. And soon their posture is worse and worse and worse, and then they wonder why they fall. Uh, I have a trekker that gives you, that invites you to hold it vertically and maintain as good a posture as possible. I did a, what I call a, a get up and go frame. If you've seen the Today Show, you'll see a picture of it. One of my friends couldn't get up from her sofa, 
and I designed this out of PVC pipe, you know, very, very high-tech stuff. <laughs> you should see my prototypes. They start with, with straws and scotch tape and foam board. <laughs> Another um, piece I've designed, um, this hasn't come into fruition, but for my own selfish reasons, I hope someday it will. Conceptually, I have designed a pair of glasses that has a camera on the bridge of the nose, bridge of the glasses, that provides high density resolution for both lenses so that when I look at a distance, it brings me the most active range. If I'm looking down to read, it also changes to that range. I have peripheral vision. I do not have central vision. That's typical of uh, macular degeneration. Uh, I can read, I read the New York Times with a, an adapted device to hold a lighted magnifying glass, and I can read the New York Times one letter at a time with my left eye. It's a pretty arduous experience. I read the Science Times this morning before I left. It's my joy. Tuesdays in the New York Times are the best. Um, but this pair of glasses is special in addition because I want it to be uh, designed for face recognition so that when someone comes up to me and said, hello, my name is Gretchen, I can reach out and say, Gretchen, nice to meet you. It takes a picture of her, her, pic her face. It also records her voice. And in my left ear, the next time Gretchen approaches me at 12 feet, it whispers into my ear, it's Gretchen. <laughs> now just think what that would do. I mean, I'm interested in it from the point of vision, but think what it would do for politicians. <laughs> or salespeople, <laughs> or those who have memory loss, <laughs> as someone said, like most of us. Yeah, I need that right now. <laughs> well, those are some of the things I've designed. I also have conceptual ideas of how we can make uh, a new line of clothing that is designed from, the bot from, from us out. We have special needs. Our legs get shorter, our pants get longer, sometimes one leg longer than the other, and we need to have clothing that adapts to that. I need to, I've designed clothing that adapts to curvature of the back. The clothing also has zippers that have a special magnetic uh, uh, sensor that beeps when I get within three inches of the socket because Winter coats, for someone like me, I am frustrated after five minutes of trying to connect the zipper. And I occasionally had to go downstairs to the receptionist and say, I feel like a baby, but I can't join this zipper. It infantilizes me. This line of clothing changes all that. Bring the fashion people in to make it desirable and, and appealing. But let the occupational therapists, who are an untapped resource, and also the elderly and the retired military, they are problem solvers, especially if they've been overseas in combat. I was overseas, but fortunately, I was never in combat. But this, what I'm saying is, these are problem solvers. And you go to the source, and you go to people who are un, untapped. So a line of clothing is one of my ideas. So building on that, Barbara, um, you live in a senior living community. And so you observe, um, as a designer, the needs there. Talk a little bit about some of the things that you're seeing at Sterling Court that inspire you or frustrate you. What are, what's missing out there? Well, let's start with a shower. The showers were made with off-the-shelf uh, equipment. The size is made for 200-pound men with a large grip. But where I live, 
we have many little women. Some are four feet high. They have very tiny hands. I've designed, redesigned a, a grab bar for the shower. The top third is for the men with large hands, with a rough surface on the interior surface so you don't lose your grip when your hands are soapy. Middle grip for somebody my size and little hands at the bottom where they need them because if they're four feet high, that's where their hands are. I also noticed one of my friends came to me and said, Barbara, this is right after the Today Show, he said, Barbara, can't you design something for me? I, live, I walk on a walker, I walk very slowly, I don't have good hearing, and when somebody comes up behind me and slaps me on the back and says, how you doing, man? It scares the life out of me. I thought, well, why not go to a bicycle shop and get a, bit, a rear view mirror? <laughs> That's all it took. And you, and you can't believe how thrilled he is to be able to see not only that somebody is coming, but who it is. As close as I am to this community and to observing needs, I could never have envisioned what Brian was going through. He taught me his needs. And I think that's a wonderful example of how we have to go to the source, the source of the, the user source. All right. Um, why don't we open it up to the audience to ask questions? Anyone have one? Uh, June, you raised your hand right away. <laughs> She's bringing you the microphone. Barbara, this is an extraordinary pleasure to hear you. And you have become my hero. Um, and also, you did rob me of being able to say I'm the oldest person here. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, but, well, I like competition. Um, <laughs> if, you, if I can take a few seconds, my area came from being involved with user-based design in healthcare. I'm not a designer, but I spent 10 years in the product design program teaching the students how to come to the uh, healthcare providers. And we actually ended up doing a course uh, for nurses in design so they could really fully participate in the process of that. And these nurses then designated themselves as nasties. That is, nurses against stupid technology. <laughs> and they're really profound in getting. And I've been thinking about it this week. And I decided that we need a core of all. I've been pushing aging too all the time to do a real course, not a four hour course, but a real course in design for elderly people. And I want to call it yeasties, young elders against stupid technology. And I hope that you and I can push them to do this. But I have one more thing that I would like you to design. For my walking sticks, if I could have a holder for coffee, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, June. That was wonderful to hear. And yes, there is competition between us for aging. <laughs> um, while we're taking questions, I wanted to ask the Academy companies to please quietly, round one of the Academy companies, come backstage because they're going to be next. But we can keep going with questions. One more question. Yeah, maybe one more question. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Um, we are working on a design for a variable for seniors to monitor their health. What in your mind are the most important things to keep in mind um, so that a senior would want to wear this rather than us forcing something on them? I think it may depend a lot on the individual and you're designing for individuals. And I, as much as each of us think we can get a good answer, 
if 30% benefit and, and the other 60% uh, or 70% don't, um, don't be surprised. But if you only design for the 30% and it's good for them, that's one approach. Uh, I think sensors are very important. I am trying to design a, uh, an airbag uh, that's wearable around the waist um, to, uh, to inflate when there's a 15% th uh, 15 degree thrust. I think all the sensors about uh, heart rate and all the other medical information, I think that's terrific. And I think it will lead to independent living, lower medical costs. I don't know if I've answered your question. That's great. Um, one thing I did want to mention, which is great, Barbara's insights are actually, um, there's two companies here working on two of the things that Barbara talked about. And I think we'll have to get Barbara tightly integrated with those teams. But they're actually Active Protective, which you guys will hear from one of the companies in the academy, um, is doing airbags for the hips. And also Narrative Apparel is that adaptive clothing that brings both style and function um, together. So I love that to see these needs intersect with what some of the entrepreneurs are already working on. And so what we wanted to end with is showing you the video. Some people mentioned the Today Show. Um, Barbara's story was actually recently featured on the Today Show. So we're going to show that video as the Academy companies are getting ready. But Barbara and Gretchen, thank you so, so much. Let's give them a round of applause. You guys can just stay maybe while they play it. Yeah, probably. A recent survey puts the average age of workers in Silicon Valley at about 30 years old. All right, but what one woman is really bucking that trend in a big way today, contributing correspondent Jenna Bush Hager is here with her story. Good morning. Uh, hi, good morning, guys. She sure is. 91-year-old Barbara Beskin may be six or seven decades older than some of her co-workers, but she's proving it's never too late to land your dream job. When you think of Silicon Valley, you probably don't think of a place like this or of someone like Barbara Beskind. But the 91-year-old lives here and is a designer for one of the area's top firms, a job she started only two years ago. Well, I have so many ideas that are, they just bubble up. Inventing is her passion. It was planted out of necessity nine decades ago during the Great Depression when she was 10 years old. I wanted to make a hobby horse and I made it out of old tires. And she dreamed of becoming an inventor, but those college courses were reserved for men. My high school vocational counselor said, well, there's no place to send you to school, and they don't take girls in engineering schools. Instead, Barbara served in the Army, pursued a career as an occupational therapist. She also wrote books and learned to paint. You say you've had five careers and five retirements. Now this is the best one. This one is her job at design firm IDEO, a company she learned about in a news report. I mean, you heard about this company and you wrote a letter. Now at nearly 90, I am anxious to be involved with others who share a passion for problem solving and innovative design. Despite poor eyesight due to macular degeneration, she takes public transportation and then walks a few blocks to IDEO's office every Thursday. Barbara, how are you? Good. It's good to see you. Thank you. Likewise. Yeah. You look great today. She's become a beloved part of the staff, so much so that a company-wide email lets everyone know when she arrives. Oh, thank you, thank you. IDEO is really my second family. Everybody gives you a hug, and uh, they're very supportive. On Thursdays, I feel 30 years younger. I think that's important. It makes sense. She sits at this couch rather than a desk and works on design projects primarily related to aging. Many of her co-workers are six, even seven decades younger than she is. What do you think you bring to the table that some of the youngins, the 27-year-olds, can't? They can't put themselves in the shoes of the elderly People who design for the elderly think they need jewel pill boxes or pink canes. We need functional equipment. And it has to be big enough it doesn't get caught in the space in the elevator. 
basically our culture is telling us aging equals decline. And Barbara is very, you know, solidly standing there and saying, you know, I'm going to call you on that. <laughs> and her retirement home is the perfect test lab for her ideas. She's modified her own walking poles, adapted a magnifying glass so she can read the paper, and built a support to help her best friend, Hetty, get up from the couch. Here I am. She's not afraid to roll up her sleeves. She's just an incredible resource for us. And she's proving even in her golden years, she still has a lot to offer. I feel that elderly people bring experience that you can't teach. Designing her dream job, a lifetime in the making. As a 10-year-old, when I wanted to be an inventor, uh, I have arrived. Thank you, thank but you. But it took me about 80 years. <laughs> oh, oh, I love yeah. her. And you know, one of the things she says is that she feels very rich. All right.